Oh, jeepers! You're listening to Smash or Pass. Hello everyone, welcome to another video on the JB and Millie channel. I am JB and joining me as always is Millie. Hi. And Rihanna. Hi. And today we have a special guest that we are so honoured to have here. We have Audrey Wazalewski. Hi. So I guess most of the people watching us right now will be familiar with their work from Scooby-Doo and the Alien Invaders, then transitioning to Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated, and then most recently Scooby-Doo and the Gourmet Ghost. But of course, the purpose of the interview is really to get to the heart of your careers, which will kick us off with our first question in that we can see, or at least according to IMDb, that you started acting from 1987 and of course you continue to find fun and interesting projects to embark on. Was there anything in particular that kick-started this love for acting? Oh, let's see. I started out um, as a little toddler dancer and loved to dance and thought that's what I was going to do until I went to my first audition where I prepared my number and I was the only one there with tap shoes and a boater. Everyone else was a bunhead in the black leotard and pink tights. And I was like, uh-oh, that's a dancer. <laughs> and so the next year I went to audition for this. It was like uh, junior high into high school. It was the school for the arts. And I was like, maybe I'm a singer. And so I got my songs together and I went and I sang some show tunes and I could hear everyone singing their arias. And I was like, oh, that's singing. And so somehow I realized it was just the performing and storytelling in whatever format it could be. And so I started out in theater, uh, was given an opportunity to do some voiceover in the DC area where I was working as a professional stage actress. And thought I found my love. I'm like, oh, this is it. This combines everything I've been doing up to this point. Um, my husband now, but my boyfriend at the time, talked me into coming to LA because he knew how much I liked voiceover and said, if you really like doing this, this is where all the real work is. And so he talked me into moving to LA and I couldn't get arrested because it is such a big pond with so much talent and there's literally 10 people doing everything. And so in spite of myself, my on-camera career took off, which I didn't imagine anybody was ever gonna put me on TV, but um, getting uh, a series regular on an ABC show right away kind of opened the door for people to then be willing to even listen to my tape. Um, and I got an agent who was fantastic and it was a totally different time. Like now auditions come through all day and I do them here by myself on my mic. And so they, they give you ample opportunity early on. Sometimes you would book a job you didn't even audition for just because your agent knew your skill set and sent you out on it and was like, she'll be perfect. Trust me. Um, and you wouldn't have read the script or known anything about it until you showed up for the job. So I'd say Push, Open the Door, um, was an ABC drama where I played a bespectacled scientist among the other teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and from that, I booked off of a sort of a party trick. I became the official voice of E.T., the extraterrestrial. And um, that then got me into other auditions, just because I could do that, somehow people were willing to listen to me do other things. Um, which is weird because that voice is so specific <laughs> that I don't know why they would believe you could do anything else. But uh, I've rambled already, I'm sorry. <laughs> you unlocked all of this by asking these questions. I was like, oh my gosh, that was 25 years, okay. And I'm piecing no, it all amazing. together of how one thing led to another of, oh my gosh, I did this geeky scientist on TV um, and then got to do this geeky alien. And wouldn't you know the first real voiceover job on a scripted project with other people in the booth was about, you know, there's a scientist and aliens. It all came together. <laughs> it really did. Yeah, absolutely. And please don't worry about rambling because <laughs> I just, I would love to personally listen back to this and just learn more or less everything that there is to know about your career. And one thing that we really love to do is not just, you know, say this is who they were when they played this and this is why we're going to get to the bottom of it. We kind of want to look behind that and see the person as well. So it's absolutely incredible that you've elaborated on that. And it's fair to say that you, of course, in your career have no doubt inspired many people. 
But for you at the start, were there any actors or actresses that have personally inspired you? Oh, I know as a as a kid, I was such a, a geek in the basement with this black and white TV, and I would spend my whole weekends watching mostly old movies, and I would watch Fred and Ginger, and I would watch Judy Garland, and, um, and of course, Carol Burnett probably had the biggest influence on what I thought I could do, and watching her impersonate other people sort of taught me how to impersonate or how to listen for the thing that makes someone special because a lot of my early work in voiceover was mimicking or voice replacement for a celebrity i mean i still do some of that um but finding the way to mimic these characters and so some of them i still hold dear that are my old timey treasures that are impersonations no one today would know is an impersonation <laughs> They don't know, like, who's Eartha Kitt? Um, or who is Ethel Merman? Um, but uh, I would say, yeah, the Carol Burnett show sort of cracked things open of that whole variety thing of people being funny and singing and acting and impersonating. Um, yeah, I think, but I watched a lot of TV as a kid and running home from school, you know, uh, appointment television was Scooby Doo. I mean, it was Scooby-Doo, it was the Brady Bunch, it was I Dream a Genie and Bewitched. And that was like daily food and watching them over and over again. So I'm quite certain they've had some impact on who I've become. <laughs> and one thing I wanted to ask about is, I mean, I know you said that voices was something you've always enjoyed. And one of the first voiceover credits we could find for you was the English dub of Pompoko. <laughs> And um, recently, with the release of Netflix's Squid Games, there's been an entire debate sparked on all of the internet over if people prefer dubbed versions or to read the subtitles. Do you have any kind of take on that debate from what you enjoy watching? I see. I, I'm going to spite myself. I <laughs> love that it offers opportunities to voiceover actors, and some people are brilliant at it. I myself prefer subtitles. I'm a pretty good reader. Um, and uh, but it does sort of key into my wanting to voice along when I read some subtitles that I'm used to doing it. So maybe I'm not relaxed and really watching that I'm kind of looking for the cue and the lip flaps and all of that. So I like that there's a dub as an option. There's there's no crime there, and people have different ways of receiving information. So I like that for people who don't read well or that's not how they can participate, that that option's available. So. I think it's a really good option to have. I mean, I know for me personally, if I've got to read, I don't feel like I can read and watch the picture at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's certainly good to be able to access a dubbed version. But can I ask what some of the challenges are with doing something like that? Perhaps say more than if you were given a script to add your own interpretation to? <sighs> Let's see. The very first dub I did was was a huge, it was a full movie, and I think it was right after Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon came out, so they were going to start to dub all of these martial arts films. And so I just got sent into the booth, and again, it was pre-internet accessibility, so nobody sent me a script. And so they just start the movie, and you watch the screen, and they give you it once, and then they start the beeps. And you have to sort of get in the rhythm of when it's time to go. And so you're reading and trying to watch the mouth at the same time. And in this situation, trying to understand the story. And I was became such a fan of the movie I was dubbing because I started out as just a maid. I was this very meek housekeeper maid. And by the end, I was like this kick-ass hero, villain, spitting snake venom on people and I was like I did not see that coming and nobody told me so it was kind of it uses all of you like you had the focus it takes is is remarkable like when I get home I was exhausted because you're just staring and trying to get into it um so there you're trying to answer the question of what's going on what are they saying and when does she start saying it and the beeps versus really when you can watch the body breathe and you're like, mm, that's that's where the mouth did, but you want to kind of breathe with the people. So it's it's demanding. Yeah, it certainly sounds it. Yeah. Your career honestly has inspired so many and me and myself, like I'm a huge fan of yours and I'm trying so hard not to like jump up and down being like, oh my gosh, this is happening. <laughs> um, but. You've done both screen work and voiceover work. And when 
especially in your early acting career, did you see yourself wanting to do one more than the other, especially as you tried out screen acting first? Hmm. Well, I, like I said, I started off on stage and I loved that because it's a communal effort and you're part of this team. And I think it made up for all those times I was picked last in gym class or something where you're part of this team and you're winning and it's theater. Then um, when I got introduced to voiceover, what I really loved about it was the, the freedom and the range that things I would never get cast to do on camera. I can now be a hot dominatrix trying to take over the planet, or I can be a talking toaster, or I, the, the range just becomes so huge with the voiceover. And you can be as creative as you want because, uh, especially now with digital, it's, it's cheap to record and so you're allowed to play, you're allowed to have ideas and you're allowed to bring your whole self to the project. The film, I love film and I love that storytelling, but it's such a different ask, um, especially if you're not one of the leads. If you're one of the leads and you're part of the project from before it's even finished being written, it's so exciting in the ownership that's awesome. But if you are hired to job in for a day, a week, a few weeks on a film, and you're just part of the fabric of the story, they really just want you to show up and be right on the first take and get it done. And so, and after waiting in your trailer for 12 hours. So film was revealed to me to be, hmm, that's not always working. It's a lot of waiting that's no exaggeration. A lot of waiting now with, again, with digital and how they're able to light, it goes a little bit faster, but it's still expensive. So they don't, there's no messing around or, oh, I have an idea. Let's try this. Where in the voiceover booth, they might give you an idea and they say, oh, we really think she should, she should be German, whatever. And you're like, okay, I've prepared that, but would you listen? What if she sounds like this fry cook from Baltimore? And, and they'll be like, well, let's give it sure. Let's see. Come on, let's do that. You know? Um, and they'll let you try it and it doesn't cost really anybody, but a few seconds and you didn't ruin the whole day and lose light. So I've grown to just adore voiceover and it's changed so much that now I can also take it with me. Like during the pandemic, I found myself on the East Coast uh, sheltering in place with my parents. It was not what I had planned to do, it was supposed to be there 10 days, um, but was able to build a padded out booth under the stairs and still work that whole time, you know, it, very weird to be in my childhood basement, l actually doing what I dreamed one day I could do, and then suddenly be back to where I started. <laughs> very strange. Um, Mom, be quiet. I'm recording. Um, but uh, I, so I love that this is really like the most the closest I get to the uh, end product, I think, is with voiceover, that everything you bring to it shows up in the finished product even better. Like every little breath and sigh and tick winds up getting animated and, and helps tell the story. Where I've been in films where I worked for two weeks and then I go to see it and I'm, I'm not, where'd I go? I'm not in that. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, wow. Thank you. And you kind of covered, I think, the next question, which is, would you say you have a preference between them? Because I think from what you said, you kind of have a more of a preference for voiceover. <laughs> I do. It just has a lot more to offer. I mean, again, I will not turn down a film and I just was part of a film that I am obsessed with and so honored to be a part of that I wouldn't give up. There's a film that just opened recently called Everything Everywhere All at Once. Yes. And it is without a doubt the most outrageous and touching and vulgar and emotional and heartfelt uh, multiverse happening. I, it's, it does what only movies can do. And the Daniels that created it, uh, to be invited to come play with them on their playground, I would always choose that. That was, that was fun. <laughs> I mean, that does sound like such a great experience. I think I was watching an interview the other day, and I, I kind of, I'm bad with names, but I think it was whoever played Short Round in Indiana Jones yeah, was Kate kind of headlining that a bit. Yeah. Oh, and he was so delicious and brilliant and told the story where he left the business for 20 years 
until he saw his the representation show up again in Crazy Rich Asians and called his agent and was like, hey, maybe I there are jobs and I can tell stories. And this happened like two weeks later. And he's brilliant. He's precious and brilliant. Wow, that is just absolutely incredible. That was such an amazing interview. And I think we're very excited to see that movie as well. So we'll definitely keep an eye out. I don't think it's out in the UK yet. I don't really know if it's got a release date over You'll here. You'll know when you start seeing googly eyes everywhere, because that's <laughs> become the trail that's left behind. There's there's googly eyes in the film. So they start showing up like on the subway and in in the coffee shop your cup might have you'll see when the googly eyes arrive you'll know it's there we already have them all around my house so. <laughs> 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 oh well, we'll definitely keep out keep an eye out for those googly eyes yeah. absolutely but i guess continuing on from your journey you know in, in chronological order i guess um we saw that your first reoccurring tv show role was in the 1998 show push what was mm -hmm. this experience like? Oh, again, came out here hoping to do voiceover, but my uh, my husband did on camera and we had friends. And so we were trying to be proactive and introduce ourselves to a town that didn't know us. It's like trying to open, we call it a pizza shop in a town that has 40,000 pizza parlors. How do you get people to buy your pizza? So we hustled and we kind of hustled it's not illegal, but we were, <laughs> we got some information. And so I actually submitted myself for push. Um, and the breakdown for that, it said, you know, scientist, uh, it's a elite, a, a college of full of elite athletes, uh, Olympic hopefuls, and that they would have a friend that hand, uh, was in their group who was a pharmacology major and she would, you know, introduce them to performance enhancing drugs. And so I was like, well, that's me, not an athlete. But the breakdown said something like this um, obese pizza face pockmarked something. And I was like, oh, the only thing I, my dad was a dermatologist. My skin's my strong suit. <laughs> I was like, but I'm like, so I quickly learned what Hollywood means when they mean character person. They'll say the most awful set of words. And I keep them in a journal somewhere of things I've auditioned for of like, oh, that's a brutal set of words mm -hmm. and I know it just means not the lead I've come to learn that that it's a wide range and the finished product doesn't wind up being whatever they say and not to take it personally so I submitted myself on this and I went through that whole process of um uh, testing for network and we shot the pilot and then half of the cast got replaced and we got picked up for series we shot 13 episodes and I learned a lot it was a blast and they turned me into a club kid with like um candy apple red hair with black tips and retro glasses um and I loved it we hit the air they aired one episode and then the next week they played a rerun of America's Funniest Home Videos instead. And that's how we found out we were canceled. <laughs> so it was, I learned a lot. I learned so much. I learned not, I was so happy I hadn't spent any of that money. <laughs> and the, because a lot of people in the show, the, some of the series regulars had gone ahead and bought themselves a beach house and a dog and a Range Rover. And that party ended and they were like, uh-oh, now what? I, I lived in this little micro hotel in San Diego where we shot it. And I was like, I'm tucking this money away. I want to go back home. <laughs> um, but I love that. And that um, actually, I think, led to uh, Scooby-Doo and the Alien Invaders. Because I don't remember auditioning for Laura. I think it was because I was a series regular on an on-camera show that my agent could say, you know, she plays the, the scientist on that show. And, oh, sure, we'd love to have her in. So I think Colette Sunderman, maybe, or maybe Chris Zimmerman was in on that one too. But I think they just trusted my agent, Pat Brady, who's my fairy god agent. She just recently retired. Miss her madly. But I think she probably pitched me off of that leverage because I don't think they were having auditions for this because the rest of the cast were the established cast it was and except Mark Hamill is the guest that week <laughs> so my very first time to be in a booth with others because all of the um ET stuff was just me 
um, I got to be in the booth with the Scooby Goo, Scooby Doo clan and be like, oh my God, there's Frank Welker. There's Frank Welker. <laughs> I adore him. I had, and that I got, I later get to be his girlfriend and spend more time in the booth with him is such yeah. a gift. But, uh, little trivia as you had me piecing this together again i felt like a detective figuring out how one thing led to another i was like i didn't audition for that and okay that must have been that and isn't that hilarious that the villains in that episode of the alien invaders are no none other than luke skywalker and et like it is just uh, <laughs> it, it, it's, it, it's kind of a small world in a way but it's just it is just incredible how things work out, especially, and that's kind of what blew my mind, because just looking through how, you know, Frank Welker was common with Scooby-Doo, and then also the Garfield stuff as well, it was just incredible how things work out. And I sort of am following in his footsteps right now of a lot of what I'm doing. I don't know, this year has been all about characters that don't have language or don't have English language, and that it's raccoons and monkeys and birds and ducks and doves. And, and so so I was like, oh, Frank, <laughs> I want to take a master class with them to help me through. Some of them are more challenging than others, but I've been making a lot of animal sounds, emotional animal sounds. <laughs> I mean, it, that is just incredible because I, I, I'll never, ever get tired of, you know, just watching voice actors be in interviews or just on the TV in general, just transforming their voice, you know, like you just see here's a person that looks obviously humanoid like myself, like everyone I know, mm -hmm. and yet mm -hmm. out of nowhere you can hear like them making the noise of a lion and it's like how do the vocal cords physically do that? It just doesn't seem possible. Oh, and I figured something else out because I realized I had not seen um, Gourmet Ghost that I never watched. So I'm like, I'm going to watch this. And I loved it, first of all. Oh my gosh, it was Bobby Flay, the whole bit. But they credit me with two characters. I think I'm no less than six characters in that episode or in that film, oh. including Nacho and Bella. Oh, oh wow. It was as amazing. I was watching, I was like, hey, that's me. I remember that. But I had no, uh, you know, it doesn't say it on IMDb. I sort of forgot. And I was like, oh, and I'm the super fan at the book signing. And I'm the uh, per the woman in the crowd that tells him to shut up. Like, there were all these, like, little shout outs that brought, I was like, oh, my gosh, that's right. But yeah, I, I mean, like, I have yeah. to credit you for the love of me getting back into Scooby because there'd been about four or five movies before that one. Where I was like, I'm not enjoying this anymore. I don't want to keep watching these anymore. And we do a podcast alongside this where we review all the movies and ultimately say <laughs> whether or not there are smash or passes and we'd watch them again or we wouldn't. And I'd had a straight six weeks of just saying, I'm not, I don't want to watch it again. I don't want to watch it again. Then we got to The Gourmet Ghost. And I was like, this is one of the best ones I've ever seen. It's I really love good. it. It is amazing. <laughs> Oh. Even the like the cinematography of it, it moves in a whole new way, but that still honors the original. Yeah, That's really good. this is what I love about doing the kind of reviews <laughs> alongside the interviews because it's like it's like you need to have proper integrity. You can't just go on to interviews <laughs> and like kind of BS people like, oh yeah, this movie that you were in was the best. But literally, if you go back and listen to it, that it really, really. really yeah, I, I, I think so my much. words were it's like restored my faith in yeah. Scooby. Yes. Like, it was Why by so? far my best. I, I don't know, like, even the art style of how... The, I think it starts off at the beginning, transitioning through time of the town where they are. And, like, certain yeah. Scooby movies, like, some of the older ones, like, I think it's Witch's Ghost and things like that, do this time progression. And, I don't know, it just... Because they started to do things where, like, they were doing Lego Scooby-Doo movies and things like that. And I was like, I'm yes. really not feeling this. And then that one almost went back to the classics. But mm. it was just, it was everything that a Scooby movie should have been, in my opinion. And I, I loved the it. writing of Tim Sheridan really kind of shone through as well. I think yeah. That's also probably, because I think that's the only one that they did. Maybe they did another one after that. I think um, they did two. Yeah. yeah. I, I love that. And again, I think that was a gift job um that Wes Gleason had hired me oh gosh probably 10 years before to do a video game um the Captain America 
video game yeah. and I was the voice of Madam Hydra, um, which is why my friend bought me. This is hilarious that I have this in my voiceover booth. She bought me a rider <laughs> prop because sometimes to get into character, you need a little help if you're going to take over the world. Um, and so <laughs> I uh, auditioned for Hydra, booked it, was so excited to go into the booth. And Wes introduces me to this German gentleman that is going to help us for the day. And I was just like, oh. I've never said I do German. I just did, I auditioned and that is my German, but I would never tell a German person that I do a German accent. This is just my, t and I was like sweating, just like, and I could feel myself flushed of like, this is gonna be awful. And we started and the, the German gentleman was like, is your family German? Do you know Germans? And I didn't have the heart to tell him that, no, but I watched a lot of Hogan's Heroes. <laughs> <laughs> I'd been to Germany in college. I went and entertained the troops stationed in, in Germany. So I spent some time with real German people, but literally my reference point is, oh God, you know? <laughs> so he gave me a pass and was happy with my performance. But I remember being just like, oh no, you, I, I showed you what I do. You're the one who said I have a German accent. I never said I had a German accent. <laughs> Oh, that, that actually reminds me because last night I did a casting workshop and I did mm -hmm. my scene mm -hmm. and then he, the casting director he said okay now can you humor me and do it in an American accent and I was like I never said I can do that okay and I like kept I kept falling out of it and I'm like I I don't know how voice actors managed to keep that because it's so hard <laughs> there are some that are an epic fail the one I cannot get is is Australian because I can do some of the different UK dialects. The Aussie is lost on me. I try to write it out phonetically if I get the script in advance, but otherwise it's like, I went and got a haircut. It's terrible. It's just awful. And so, I, I've, all, so I've learned to nobly pass on that. I'm saying there must be someone who can do that better. Mm -hmm. I don't have to be the answer to everything. <laughs> I mean, I do absolutely love that you mentioned some of your time working on video games and of course you know kind of Marvel and Hydra something we love but another game that I grew up with is that initial Tarzan game where of course they brought you in to play Turk and obviously with it being a game I remember playing it a lot of it is kind of the action sounds but in terms of taking on almost a character that was portrayed by someone else in a different medium so I think it was Rosie O'Donnell that plays mm -hmm. Turk in the animated feature is there any challenges that result in almost inheriting a role versus being the first person to play it? Yes. Um, I'm blessed with being a really solid mimic. And if I can hear someone, I can repeat it. And so when it came to like, I, cause I was hired to be the official voice of Turk. There's Disney character voices is a, branch of Disney. So I was the official Turk. So I did the video games, the singing, if it was in another language, um, all of the toys. I, what did I find? I found this hilarious. Um, um, again, there were all this, like, if you go mm -hmm. to McDonald's, there was a straw that would say something when you sucked on it. And so I did all the sort of merchandise and games and toys. And I'm laughing that this is after an hour in the booth, this is what they went with. And it's sort of it still works, but, um, yeah, I'm not really, yeah, <laughs> just like Rosie. Um, but, uh, I remember the first thing they needed me to do was pretty much lift the scenes that were in the movie and recreate them for the game. And so I was like, oh, I can do that. Then came the other jobs where I had to now expand the character. And that's when I sort of stressed because it's a big leap of saying, is this what the character would do? Because it's not my creation. And sometimes, again, if it's action sounds or certain things I'm comfortable doing, but there have been some, um, well, like when I do celebrity voice matching, if you're just adding lines here and there or doing it for airplane consumption and fixing the dirty words or whatever, uh, I can match and, and sort of embody what they're doing because I know I see the performance. But when they're going to branch out and be like, no, it's Tarzan 2, Turk's Big Adventure. And you're like, do I have the freedom to have Turk grow or am I supposed to strictly honor what I've seen him do 
and only make the emotional choices and vocal choices that are already in the library or can it grow so it's i it's sort of uncomfortable i don't like it as much because i feel like i may be doing a disservice to the original person i don't know <laughs> did that answer your question yeah it's just i just get so nostalgic i can't believe that oh. like I, I don't, it's just amazing how I've just mentioned this character that I really love and then you come out with a, a plushie of them and I'm like, oh my gosh. Yeah. I, I oh, and even... I just remember this was so hard because this is pre-YouTube. So all I had was a little, they sent me a, a tape with some of her lines and I kept trying to get to find Rosie and I couldn't go, YouTube wasn't there yet. So there's a vintage video store that's about a block. Um, a mile from our house and I would rent like East of Eden whatever uh, a league of their own I was trying to find what where can I find Rosie speaking um, and then her TV show was on and I would set the VCR and try to watch the Rosie O'Donnell show and just pick up any little things that could help me get into it um, and it took so much time it was so much effort now you're like hello internet give me a sound sample <laughs> um, so I put a lot of effort and so I'm haunted by here I'll give you one this is the I don't know how, if it still holds up, but it's in my mind. I hear her going. Can you believe that guy drops us like a newborn giraffe? Kaplop, then comes waltzing in here and oh, with the face and the eyes and the, ah, all right. But don't make me do anything embarrassing. That was like the first line I learned as Rosie. <laughs> but in truth, it wasn't really Rosie. It was Turk because I think Turk is rosy, ratcheted up. I think it's paced and pitched up a little bit. Mm. So I kind of do a younger row. If you were to play like Rosie being rosy, I think she sits lower than that and slower than that. And we made one discovery during a session that was going very long. And so they ordered pizza. And apologies to Rosie O'Donnell. But after I had consumed a lot of pizza, the voice was better. <laughs> I don't know if it was the cheese or the feeling heavy and not breathing as well, but somehow the, that was how I sort of then locked in and being like, make sure you go on a full stomach and don't worry about being light and bright. It's it's a heavier sound and it's ah. I mean, that's amazing because I can only imagine like nowadays if if I were to discover something like that, it would just be like, okay, all the takeaways are now going on as a business expense. That's what we're going to do now. <laughs> so, that's absolutely amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, speaking about Rosie O'Donnell, I mean, I did notice on IMDb that there was a movie in 2006 called The Queer Duck, and that Queer you play Duck. a character called Rosie O'Donnell there. Yeah, it's it was kind of a um, raunchy animated series. Um, gosh, was that Jason Alexander? Is he the duck? I don't even know anymore. But there was a scene, and it wasn't very flattering to Rosie, um, and it was just a joke, almost like a um, uh, family guy kind of moment. Mm -hmm. And so I did Rosie. I did Rosie, and I think my agent booked me on it based on the fact that, well, you know she's the voice of Rosie at <laughs> Disney. <laughs> um, if I, I don't have the courage to listen to it and hear if it's any good. <laughs> I don't know. I guess, you know, returning to the, you know, the games and stuff again, um, in 2001, you were then the voice again for Tarzan Freeride. Did you have to re-audition for that role or was it just that you'd already been there and they were impressed with your work? Um, Disney takes it very seriously that they do the official voice of each character. And so there is, until that person's no longer available or they're not happy with how it's going, anytime, whether it's a ride, a game an appearance, whatever, the voice is going to be the same person because they like that continuity. Um, I know there have been people, I think once Tarzan sort of disappeared and some other things came up, I know there's, like, I think I even did Rosie for the, there's something what, that Rosie and Whoopi do in the theme park. I, again, you guys forced me to look backward. Every day is always about, ah, oh, what's this challenge and looking forward. And so I sort of, you've made me remember some suppressed... <laughs> joys and pains <laughs> and I guess another thing to reflect on that uh, we noted was that you also had a role in an episode of Friends which is obviously a hugely popular show what was your experience like here and do you remember any interesting stories from your time on set 
Okay, I love that you picked out Friends because it stays in our theme because I was a bespectacled scientist. I played the paleontologist. Um, and uh, it was late in the in the Friends. It might have been the final season of Friends. Um, and they don't waste any time. I was in awe watching them. I, I thought of them as like the Lakers, that they were this elite team of comedians and that sometimes sitcoms can be because of the style of how you go in and do the table read and then they do rewrites and you rehearse each day and the network gives notes that they can be these long days they would do one hour days two hour days where they would just come in focus get it done and get out of there and i know they had been given a huge raise that year and i didn't begrudge them that at all all that I was like they earn every penny the focus and the understanding they had of this particular material and how they worked so well together because I've been in plenty of shows where there's somebody that's slowing it down where there's a personality that's making the day infinitely longer and who's not prepared and so what should be a five-hour day becomes a 15-hour day and so I would not give that person a raise but these uh, they were like comedy ninjas they came in they did it and they got out um and it was fun. I mean, you know, I didn't, because of that, I didn't spend a lot of time with anyone. It was fast. Amazing. And another, another kind of thing that you worked on that we're nostalgic for is Garfield. And we have to ask, because we have mentioned Frank Welker before, did you get to meet them when working on this project? Because they were also the voice of Fred and Scooby-Doo, but they worked here too. I got to meet, I met Fred during, uh, so that was either 99 or 2000 when we actually recorded uh, Alien Invaders. And I was just dazzled by watching him work and was in love. I mean, at the time, was he 60? And he was this hot teenage boy. Like, <laughs> that I was just even, that I'm like, I buy this whole, and a dog and, a, you know, whatever else. And every, and in between takes, he can't turn it off and so thus he'll be a dripping faucet where everybody's like does everyone hear that there's something dripping and it's just frank you know making sounds um uh he's just such a generous spirit and he's been so supportive of uh, everything i do he'll see, he'll see some on camera stuff and 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 give me a message about that and he's just about the loveliest human being um and then when i got to be his girlfriend that was easy to fall in love with with Garfield and we do that's one of the few places where we're all in the booth because so much of it isn't that way anymore as we've as technology has increased people can be scattered all over and so they record one at a time but I loved that we would Garfield together and that was a I can't believe I got to play Arlene that was random a huge script because it was a film was the first one and I had been doing a lot of on-camera stuff at that point um and walked into the audition and it was in this weird sort of con house mansion converted into offices. And so we were in this big room with lots of windows and they had a chair and a camera, which would look so much like an on-camera setup. And I was like, this is a voiceover. How am I gonna, and I had this huge script. And it was the first time that I kind of gave myself permission to do what I needed to do in the room. And I said, if you don't mind, and I knelt on the floor and I laid all my pages out in a circle around me so that I could just, because it goes fast, that sometimes it's one line on a page and the action is so fast. that I was like, there's no way I can do this. It's going to look like a weird on camera. I'm not going to be able to embody what she needs to do. And so I kind of just took control of the room and said, here's what I need to do to do my job this is how i know how to do voiceover and i when i left i was like they either think i'm the biggest high maintenance weirdo or i did my job and i guess i did my job <laughs> and they let me come play in the booth but that's always so weird i hate when there's a camera and it's voice because sometimes you have to do really weird things to make the voice happen <laughs> i mean i just I love Garfield so much. Like, yeah. oh, I remember there was this DVD I had, and I don't know which one it was, but every time it would play the trailer for Garfield Gets Real, and I was I was a stupid kid. I didn't know that it meant that it would eventually come to a cinema or that I would eventually just go into, like, a shop and it would be on DVD. But I remember, and I don't recall, like, the actual film that it, that it was, but I remember just seeing the trailer time and time again when I was re-watching. And so that the first time that I actually went into a shop and saw it on DVD, 
I remember like getting really excited. I think my parents were probably so embarrassed to be out and about <laughs> with me that day, but I was just so excited. And then I think I must have destroyed the disc because I watched it that much, but it was just, oh. I was addicted to that movie when I was small. It's uh, you'll know better than I do. Is that, again, I had a, a childhood dream come true. Is that with Tim Conway or is he in the next one? Is he in the Gets Physical or... But there was one of the Garfield films where Tim Conway was in the room. And I'm like, I'm, I'm on the Carol Burnett show. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> like... I never watched Garfield Gets Physical for some reason. I watched Gar. Garfield gets real, mm -hmm. and then I was addicted to the follow-up show that I think over here it played. I want to say Nickelodeon, but I'm not Ooh. entirely sure. Maybe uh, it was Cartoon Network. I think it was Boomerang. So I know there was one on Boomerang that oh, I you know what? used I to watch. Right. I don't know what happened to us. We kind of just faded away and started doing a lot of educational recording. That I think a school district in Virginia or something decided Garfield would be a good tutor. And so we did all of this sort of um, online learning tutorials brought to I've, you by Garfield and friends. I've got this like image of Garfield teaching everyone how to make the perfect lasagna. It's like, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> I think they had to give him an alter ego that there were like, there was Garfield that's Garfield. And then there was like Professor Garfield so that he could actually know things beyond lasagna. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing and I guess another instance where you've appeared in the same projects as other Scooby actors was in the recent show Good Girls and did you ever work directly with Matthew Lillard for this? No we were our storyline was all with the is it the Hill family with the and so we were just in their house and we shot on on different days from everybody else the only person i got to see was may in the makeup trailer at one point i got to see may whitman and i've known her since she was tiny and was a nun on her tv show and we've stayed in touch and done voice stuff together since um but i, I yeah i didn't didn't get to see him but i i love his shaggy yeah I love he's just shaggy. such a great shaggy and I guess moving more on to like your history with Scooby-Doo, did you ever watch any Scooby-Doo growing up? And if so, did you have a favorite movie or TV show? All right, here we go. Full disclosure. <laughs> All I have ever wanted <laughs> is to be Velma in Scooby-Doo. I don't do a lot of cosplay, but my go-to Halloween costume every year is Velma. Hang on. It's not such a such such a reach. All right. Oh. That's pretty good. God, hello. I love her. I she's she. Uh, I watched Scooby Doo regularly as a kid, and Velma spoke to me. She was I was the science nerd. Um, wrote songs about the periodic table. Um, my big victory at uh, baseball camp was that I was a detective and figured out that the the paint on the softballs was leaving a trail in the pitching machine and that's why it was broken and that was like my big heroic moment was my detective work on figuring out why we could no longer use the batting machine. Um, so I loved Velma and when I did um, push I thought of my character as the Velma of push. Then I got word that they were making the movie, the live action movie. And I was like, what? And so I had pictures of me that year for Halloween where I was dressed like Velma and I gave it to my agents at that time. I'm no longer with them. Um, and I said, I would really love a chance just to audition, just to audition. And they kind of looked at me like they were not Scooby-Doo fans. It made no sense to them. They didn't know what my passion was about and they did not get me in the room and I was like it didn't seem like a hard pitch at the time of like I play a bespectacled scientist <laughs> she's a bespectacled scientist with red hair um that said love Linda she's exquisite she's a lovely human being and bravo but I still my biggest regret was not getting to go in the room and be my inner Velma <laughs> and she is hold up she's everywhere I have a a cell in front of my desk as in
in inspiration. And my pencil holder wow. is Velma. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. I replaced her flashlight with my pencil because I love her. <laughs> as soon as you mentioned that you dress up as Velma for Halloween, Mm -hmm. I, I dressed up as Velma for Halloween and I used to write songs with like the pe about the periodic table and I'm like, this is amazing. Stop it. Mine <laughs> were, I was sort of halogen focused was sort of my thing. <laughs> yeah. So I, so I think, I think my sister had the Scooby-Doo lunchbox and that I was stuck with some sort of bicentennial patriotic lunchbox, but we had the Scooby-Doo lunchbox. Um, I, and again, it was, it was daily entertainment, you know, Monday through Friday, we would come home and watch Scooby-Doo, where are you? Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, like if, if you were to take over for the voice of Velma now, I would be so happy because like, I think Velma's got a, a history of changing voices quite often and I quite miss Mindy Cohen's portrayal of the role and the current person, I, I kind of, uh, it, it's hit or miss with me personally. And so to kind of get a fresh take on Velma now would be absolutely amazing. I can think of probably no one better than yourself to take over that because I just, I kind of I love, need someone. I love else. Mindy. Mindy caught me in that outfit one Halloween. We had the same agent at that time and we were at a Halloween party and she just, she lost it. She was laughing of like, oh my God. You were Velma. Um, but, uh, yeah. Oh, but that, Kay Makuchi, she's lovely. She's hilarious. It's, again, part of that re-imaging Scooby for a new generation where they change the animation as well as the, the voice goes a little bit more contemporary. Um, she's hilarious. Yeah, they always change. And apart from Fred, you know, because Frank apart Welker, like yeah. you say, has been all the way from 1969 <laughs> to 2022 and probably will keep voicing the role until... 30, 58 or some, some of a <laughs> endless can time. Can <laughs> oh, my little stool's running away. There we go. <laughs> I can't believe I exposed myself. Um, yeah, I'm a huge Velma. There was a movie that came out, or no, it did not come out. There was an audition um, for there was going to be a live action Velma movie. And I know I was way too old to be that but they were casting her aunt and i got called in to audition for her aunt and i was so excited and i prepared the material and i had this outfit that i thought was perfect <laughs> it probably would have scared them um and uh the afternoon of the audition i got a call and they said the funding fell through it's not happening oh see i was always theorizing that it would have been the daphne and velma movie but no, oh gosh, I didn't hear about that. They have spoken about doing some more things of like Velma progression. Oh, the Mindy K Kaling one? Mindy, K Mindy Kaling, I guess, is going to do something for hmm. Netflix? Yeah. Streamy, streamy McStreamers? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess um, we'll then switch up the scene because like, we've kind of spoken about your personal background with Scooby Doo. But now touching on, once again, on the Alien Invaders, for you don't think that you auditioned for the role of Laura, I suppose my updated slash adapted question would be almost how, do you remember how was that first day recording for Laura, or at least your initial impressions of the character, especially coming in as almost a villainous role that Scooby is known for? Well, and again, I might be misremembering this, but because it's pre-computers, I don't think I got a script until I showed up oh. and didn't really know what was asked of me, just that I was going to be Laura, she's a scientist, um, whatever. And that they very much, for the first time, anyone hired me to basically use my voice, which I don't know that I've used since. Like Arlene is the closest. Arlene and Laura are the closest to getting hired to use my voice. The rest is all ridiculous and boys and aliens and animals <laughs> um but uh i remember again walking in and seeing luke skywalker doing a crossword puzzle and being like what is happening <laughs> and, um but and they were such a team they had all worked together before and so i was the newbie in the room um and so i just remember 
loving every minute of it and watching all of it. Yeah. I can, what's weird is each of these, where there's been a different director and writer and different cast sometimes, all of the Scooby-Doo has been recorded at the same studio, which is weird because it's a little studio very near my house called Salami Studios, mm -hmm. and it's not on the lot, it's off the lot, and it's this, this little boutique studio that makes very good turkey bacon. <laughs> Um, but, uh, so I always picture, I can picture exactly the room. That's the Scooby room where I've recorded all things Scooby. Um, and I think, uh, Col I really think Colette, Chris Zimmerman's credited, but why in my mind, I picture Colette directing me, um, and that, you know, she would just sort of guide us through a few pages at a time. And so the story kind of revealed itself as it went along is the way I remember it. I don't think I got the whole script and knew where it was going. You are quite right, because the vibe of the set, for all, obviously, it wasn't, you know, live action. So it wasn't like people had cameras physically pointing at people all the time. But even just the behind the scenes sections, I think... Even like the kind of guest stars that I can't, you know, I can't even recall how long they would have been there for. But say Jennifer Love Hewitt recording the song at the start of that, like when she was giving her interview for the bonus features, she's like surrounded with Scooby stuff. And it just looked like a lot of fun. Uh... <laughs> but I oh, guess, I she... yeah, I don't know. Because everyone seen, looked like they were in a similar place, just surrounded with plushies and even cardboard oh, cutouts. That... Oh, they must have set that up for. I don't want to break anyone's heart, but where we record is a very beige, ro beige soundproof room with a wall of glass, <laughs> just a big recording studio. And because they record so many other things there, nothing is distinctly Scooby. No, they probably got like a Except behind the, the scenes, yeah, behind the scenes room, which I kind of miss now because the bonus features on the DVDs are just kind of like just bonus episodes of the show, which is still really, really cool. But I do miss seeing the interviews of the cast members and all of that, all of that stuff. But I guess my next question about the movie is, do you recall how long after you were cast you started recording? Oh, I think it was a matter of days of checking my availability of they want to hire, it might be Tuesday afternoon and saying, um, are you free Thursday at noon? Colette wants you to do Scooby-Doo. Be like, all right, I'm free. Ooh, that's perfect. And I think you've kind of already answered my next question about recording separately or with like the rest of the cast. So I think... Um... Well, that one was um, all together, but then uh, Gourmet Ghost and uh, Grasp of the Gnome were solo. That was just me and the director. Mm. Which I know recently they have done kind of like, they almost did some interviews for a Scooby-Doo anniversary with the cast. And I think it was more amid COVID, but... Um, I think Warner Brothers had almost arranged for them to have their own personal studios at home so they could still record. And I think it all is done completely separately now from what they were saying in those interviews. But this was even pre, pre COVID, I think because I wasn't part of the, I, I bet the mystery machine crew all records together so that it can have, they can play off each other, but as sort of the guest cast and the the villain or things, all of that can. I think we may have even punched in, and a lot of the animation may have been primarily finished without lip flaps. Because I can picture watching, I can picture seeing what the queen looked like on the screen, and and Colette showing me who that was and showing me you're now going to be the pirate girlfriend and and being able to see what they looked like. Um, and I don't know if that was true for Gourmet Ghost. I think we may have gone in and done some ADR after it was done and added some more things. Mm -hmm. Um, so I guess one thing that I want to see if you remember, and I ultimately wouldn't blame you if you don't remember this, but have the, do you remember if there were any scenes that you can visualize recording but that you did that you didn't see in the movie no i i feel like everything we recorded stayed in on, uh, across the board on each of these each of these jobs i think because they write it so tight yeah and that they they sort of know by the time i join the project they know what they want um 
Yeah, I don't think there's anything. If anything, maybe something. There might have been a joke with the librarian. But not much. Maybe mm -hmm. a line or something. I guess that like you say the writing's quite tight. I guess they have quite a clear vision before it even gets to that stage. Yeah. Um, so uh, still on Alien Invaders here. By the end of the movie, your character attempts to capture the aliens for profit. In your personal life, do you have any curiosity about aliens and their existence? Well, because E.T. got me a down payment on my house, I do believe in aliens. I do believe in aliens. <laughs> and um, and the fact that my contract for E.T. said the official voice through DreamWorks was the official voice of E.T. in perpetuity throughout the universe, oh. which always made me think that they thought maybe, like, even if an alien shows up, they're going to have to pass the muster and not steal my job. Yeah, they can, like bring you in as like the, the representation of planet Earth, the consultant between the two. That's amazing. But, but then I just saw Neil deGrasse Tyson do an interview that made me really, he seems to believe that there's people listening to us and we've given them plenty of fodder that every TV wave we've put out into the universe is hitting somewhere and they're getting an opinion of us based on our television. Oh no, wow, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine if that was like what their opinions were to be based on? That'd be so interesting. I don't know. The aliens could just start solving mysteries for us. That's yeah. what they could do. Wouldn't it be interesting to like see how different things would pan out depending on the show that they watched to gain their interpretation of what we were like? <laughs> I hope not Law and Order. Let's see. <laughs> Keep it light. Maybe Friends. <laughs> There's some like futuristic things where they could be like think that we're so far advanced than we are or like watching reruns of things from the 20s where they're like oh okay well there's nothing to worry about here like you know they've not developed this yet so. the flintstones versus the jetsons they, yeah <laughs> they could watch um back to the future and think wait shouldn't there be hoverboards already in flying cars <laughs> So um, I think this is the last question I personally have about Alien Invaders, and that is, do you have any other stories from filming that you could share with us? <laughs> Golly. Again, every, it was another focus group. These people know their characters. They go in. Colette directs a really tight production and there's like not a lot of messing around because there's so many people in the booth um so just kind of fun watching people work it did wind up being the first time i worked with a lot of people who would show up in my life later so like i said frank um uh kevin michael richardson yeah. adore him and we have the same agent and i've known him ever since and we've worked together on a lot of things um candy milo uh was the first time i met her and we went on to do a teenage robot together for several years um and i remember watching candy and again she knew everybody and, she, and being like oh i envied like she was on the inn. i want to be in like i know i'm a visitor and she was guest cast but she was in and i was like i want in <laughs> Um, do you remember how long approximately it took to, uh, to record your scenes? Oh, wow. Um, I think the way they did that is they would rent us, rent us, they would buy us for the day and they would bring us in in combinations. Like there'd be some scenes where everybody was in the booth. And then if it was a scene with just uh, the scientists in the lab, they would have the three of us in and everybody else would go in the waiting room. And since they would do that kind of round robin, it would take time to change the mics and move everybody around. And so it wound up being sort of like a whole day with a lunch break. Um, the other two, when it was just me, they bought me for a session. And so it was less than three hours, you know, it was fast. Oh, wow. I guess that's also like a really big difference between like, on like on, on screen filming to compared to voiceover because the turnaround is so quick because you don't have to change sets it's still just you yep. say it and experiment and then it's all out there instagram and all the behind the scenes have ruined it by needing um hair and makeup now but it used to take even less time when you would just show up in your pajamas because nobody could see you <laughs> <laughs> all the 
about this, you're like, oh, no, I should probably put on shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Just show up to the, like, in the booth with, like, fluffy bunny slippers or something. <laughs> Which is again with the COVID, my whole routine of like, oh, go get some tea, in my bathrobe, talking at home. Yeah, I had to change gears and try to get dressed and professional just so that I could get more energy because it was getting really lazy of going from the bed to the mic. So after the movie came out, did you watch it back? And if so, what did you think? I remember watching that one back and I was just so thrilled to be a part of the Scooby Sphere. Um, about 10 years later then, I remember getting a phone call from a friend in college who's like, my kids are in love with you. They just saw, and so to know that it lives on and that he recognized, he goes, the minute you came on, I knew it was your voice. And that was just, that was fun. That he was like, I, I knew Laura was you. I knew I waited for the credits, but I knew it was you. Um, so I, I'm, I'm proud and you guys made, again, by having me look back on it, I, I just keep, again, looking forward to the next thing that I forget that I did something that was really, it is so cool. <laughs> I'm a Scooby-Doo villain. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> like, thank you so much because like all of this is, it's just so much fun. And we've spoken to some people who have been asked to sign some really wacky and weird things from conventions. So have you been ever been asked to sign any Scooby-Doo merch or anything that you didn't expect to sign? No, isn't that interesting? No, no Scooby-Doo. Um, the one that gets the most sort of requests are the Skylanders. Oh. Uh, and they'll sometimes people will send me the figurine. Um, oh, here. I've got visual aids. We've got <laughs> Stealth Elf. Oh. Um, who then I got, I got replaced when they turned it into a series. They stunt cast the whole thing and I had to say goodbye. But I still get people, there's like uh, cards and things that people collect. And so sometimes they'll send me those to sign. But I'm thinking I don't get. Hmm. Not a lot of signing stuff for the for the animation. Huh. Yeah, I've had some people ask for for um, Mad Men was a on camera show I did, and that has a big fan base, and people will send me pictures. Um, but yeah. I'm not part of the, I know that a lot of people do the signings. I haven't been, I don't know that I've done something as iconic and as worthy of attending that people would get excited about. I remember attending one signing when Teenage Robot first came out and I had a whole stack of, of pictures of Tuck and I went home with all of them. Mm -hmm. It was heartbreaking. <laughs> Nobody cared. <laughs> if we were there, I think we would like, We'd be yeah, first in line to match anything with you. <laughs> incredible, especially because it's obviously not just the, the one Scooby thing that I guess we, we focus on here, but it's also the future as well. So, for example, the Mystery Incorporated series. And I guess I don't quite know when Mystery Incorporated was. I think it was the difference between Alien Invaders in 2000 and then Mystery Incorporated perhaps in 2010 maybe about us, but were there ever any talks of you returning to Scooby in between them that just didn't come into fruition for whatever reason? No, each one was its own surprise to begin with. And so there was no, you know, of course, there's always as you leave, hey, Audrey, we'll see you again. We'll think of you again. But there was no sort of um, contract. Like they've each been good to me. Colette that directs that has, I've worked on other shows that she's directed and Wes, um, he's been very good to me. and you made me put the connect the dots and I'm like oh that's right he always thinks of me it's usually crazy accents <laughs> but I had never put that together but that by doing um chef sue was this crazy mad russian and I'd done a multiple germans for him and somebody finnish where again he brought in a professional that was critiquing my dialect <laughs> after the fact where they're like you're awesome you got the job now this person's gonna listen and, uh -huh. oh, that, that one did not go as well as the German <laughs> see speaking of your voice when you first joined the zoom call I was like oh my gosh you have such a lovely voice because the last thing yeah. I heard was 
sous chef sue and so hey, going from your voice in that to joining the zoom call today i was like she sounds lovely I like mean, that's chef amazing sue is just so always <laughs> abrasive but so funny at the same time <laughs> yeah. so charismatic because it was like when especially in that scene where it was shaggy and it's like what did you do wrong why is she shouting at you and it's like i give them cheese they eat i give them <laughs> like ravioli they eat like it's just I love that so much. That's it's amazing. just absolutely incredible. I get to do a lot of Russians for whatever reason. And I don't know that my Russian, again, if someone were from Russia, they'd be like, what the heck is she doing? <laughs> um, and I'm okay with that. But it's all loosely based on right after I graduated college, I taught at a school in McLean, Virginia, that was largely um, students of ambassadors, our children mm -hmm. of ambassadors were the students. And one of my students was this little Polish girl, Patricia. And I loved listening to her speak. Oh my God, she was so tiny and so, oh, so emotional. Even for an 11 year old, she was so much passion and she wanted to be a singer. And, oh, and it had like a sexuality that kind of unnerved me for someone so tiny, <laughs> but I loved her. And she, we were doing Guys and Dolls and I couldn't correct her because I loved her dialect so much that, that she would be in Adelaide and she would be like, no. This is here, the average Omeri female, basically insecure. Dotos on the road, the tendency is not. But she would say, Do you see my wedding whale? And I was like, I love wedding whale forever, is how I get myself into the Russian dialect. <laughs> it is my wedding whale. <laughs> that is incredible. So I guess, based on that, because we've kind of already covered the Mystery Incorporated side of things, if Rihanna just wants to go to your first question for Gourmet Goes, because I like, I think that's kind of, mm. oh, because I we, literally, I just re-watched that last night. Yeah, last night, JB was like, what do we watch? I was like, we're watching Gourmet Ghost. We've got an interview tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so your latest Scooby-Doo appearance was for the Gourmet Ghost, where you played both, choose, uh, sorry, uh, Chef Sue and the librarian, and you also elaborated that you basically played like six different characters as well. So touching more on Sue Chef Sue, what was it like to play a character so angry but also comedic at the same time? Oh, that is, it's always such good therapy when you get cast as someone that's slightly unhinged because you just leave lighter, you can leave it all in the in the booth. But I think I remember with, with Wes that we would do, again, because it was just me. So he would we would look at a, a line or a set of lines and I would give him three in a row. And so we would do um, less angry, more grumbly, you know, that we'd be like, nyet, 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 nyet. and she would like be under, under her breath and then there'd be the one that's like yet move and she'd just make noise and then he would be like go ahead and just be insane and it would be like yet 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 and so i wouldn't know until it was finished what he was going to use again which is why i love the voiceover that we just play and discover things of what's funnier if she's just grumbling or or grunting and he'll be like yeah this time yeah give me one where she he's fun director and we just played especially when it's just the two of us we get to kind of create her oh wow that sounds like so much fun like i wish i was there watching like whilst you were doing it because even <laughs> just that little bit <laughs> and i think i remember the librarian has a hint of some sort of new england dialect and that he wanted and i was like wes oh i wish you'd have told me before i showed up because i don't really have it and the only thing i had in my head was um uh kathy bates had just done dolores claiborne <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and then all i could picture was like sometimes dolores a woman <laughs> and i was like some somewhere in there's where she's going to live somewhere in there and but i was like oh i don't do new england all right here we go so i think <laughs> it's loosely based on dolores claiborne <laughs> thank you so much for that um <laughs> just like taking a moment to like take it all in because that was just oh that's amazing um so given that the roles of sue chef sue and the librarian are such like a different contrast to each other were you ever shown any storyboards or drawings of the characters before voicing them i again in my mind i can picture having seen a video of, so, like, I don't know if it was, like, unfinished, 
that I did get a sense of what, oh, hold up, wait a second. No, only, I think I may have only saw Sue when we went back and added some extra ADR, like the crowd running around and we picked up a couple of extra lines for her that I think the first time we recorded and laid down the majority of it, it was just, she's angry. And I think we may have played with dialects and landed on Russian. I think we may have played with whether she was uh, French or German. And that Russian was just funnier. No, 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 no. Yeah. Nine. Yeah. I think yet <laughs> is funny. It's, it, it is. <laughs> it is amazing. And that's kind of already answered my next question. So I guess my last question for the gourmet ghost would be once it was kind of done and released, did you end up watching it after the fact? And if so, what did you think? I literally watched it this week. Because wow. I I re I only realized I hadn't that I like I knew in theory that it, it had probably come out, but again, you're just always thinking about the next job and moving forward, and realized I I hadn't taken time to watch it, so I watched it and I loved it. And like I said, I was just so tickled that I was I had no idea. Again, I sometimes I get asked to do interviews, and I'm sort of reticent because. You know, I'm I had an auxiliary voice, and I was in and out in ten minutes, and I don't have anything to say. And but then watching it, I was like, I'm all over this episode, <laughs> <laughs> especially because now I play um, a job I'm doing right now is uh, back at Disney doing Alice's Wonderland Bakery, and I'm her cat. And I didn't mm -hmm. re I thought it was my first nonverbal cat. And then I saw this and I was like, oh my god, I'm, I'm Nacho. I'm Bella. I've been... I mean, it Bella. is amazing because I, I don't know what I was imagining beforehand because, of course, it's kind of a shame because through the... La like, through... If there's not, like, interviews out there, I guess the closest thing people have to refer to is IMDb. And so it's, like, kind of fresh ground that you do play, you know, um, Nacho Flay, which is absolutely incredible to discover because we genuinely didn't know that. And <laughs> in hindsight, though, I don't know what I was expecting if they actually got the real life cat of Bobby Flay and just like started, like <laughs> holding them by the microphone, like, come on, do something, we need this. The DVD's coming out. But It wasn't until a certain line. At first, when, when the cat first showed up, I was like, oh, Frank. And then there was like a certain line that I was like, that's, no, wait a minute, now I remember, <laughs> that's me. I mean, thank you so, so much for, like, because you have been so generous with your time today, and we've abs we've loved absolutely every second of this. And moving on to, like you say, you know, we've discussed a lot about the past now, but to wrap things up, the future, do you have any upcoming projects that you can share with us today, please? All right, so the animation-wise, the Alice's Wonderland Bakery just was released here a few months ago, and it's so stunningly hypnotic the colors are overwhelming and it's just sweet as can be uh and i'm her cat i'm chamomile the mouse i'm Threon of hearts the card god and um bunnies and lots of auxiliary things the core of the cast are actual small children um there's a series coming out called dino daycare um and i play a baby dinosaur Again, no words, just sounds. <laughs> um, so that'll be on the lookout for that. Um, and then movie-wise, there's the Everything Everywhere All at Once that you should not miss. And uh, a film um, that's just beautiful. Uh, it's a short called North Star. And Malcolm Getz and... Uh, uh, Coleman Domingo, and it's it's just a beautiful for a short. It has so much uh, crammed into it, and and so very serious, and not like the animation at all. <laughs> oh, well, that was great! Thank you so much. And I think the last question we have is, in terms of your work and upcoming projects and everything, is there a place that's best for people to keep up to date with your work? Is that either social media or a website? Yeah, um, let's see. I have a website, 
um, AudreyWazalewski.com, and I try to update good news that's happening in a little news section. I'm on Instagram um, as Audrey Wazalewski. Um, Twitter, I'm not sure after today if I'm going to leave Twitter. <laughs> I just got a news flash that Elon Musk, I don't know what it will become. So that's <laughs> happening. Um, but uh, usually I try to post things um, the, uh, on Instagram and, and on my website in the news uh, feed. Yeah, well, that's great. Thank you so much. I, try and you. leave all of them in the description. Maybe hold the Twitter for now, as we say, until we know what's going <laughs> on. But I guess the rest of them will be in the video show notes for everyone to check out. And again, a sincere thank you for all the time you've given us today and for everything you've shared. So thank you so much for that. And as well, thank you for everyone listening to this because this has been another interview on the JBN Really channel and we hope you stick around for future episodes like this. So yeah, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the day. <laughs>